It's now time to talk Kansas City Chiefs football on the Arleds Football Network here on the Arleds Football YouTube channel. And when we talk Kansas City Chiefs football, we're now talking uh, with our uh, newest addition. Uh, we've already spoken to him, Charles Goldman, uh, conference managing editor for A to Z Sports. Uh, we had an opportunity to uh, preview the draft. And now, of course, it's time to recap it with this uh, video. So, Charles, thanks again for uh, joining us here on the network and the channel. Thanks for having me back, Greg. <laughs> you got it. So it must have made a good impression because you're having me back. <laughs> absolutely. That's the way it works, right? So yeah. uh, the uh, trip to the White House actually is over. Matter of fact, just concluded a few minutes ago as the time we are recording this on Friday. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, that's getting a little bit uh, sort of like uh, Forrest Gump. I'm sure there's like a, a nice little video you guys can come up with there as often as Forrest Gump uh, made it to the White House and he was kind of getting bored of it. Uh, maybe uh, you guys will probably get bored of visiting the White House after winning the Super Bowl as often as you guys have recently. So, hey, I mean, we back to back and now we're going for the three Pete. So, uh, you know, what, one more year and then, you know, maybe we can surrender that to somebody. Else. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Well, it should be a lot harder this year if all these quarterbacks in the AFC stay healthy. But, hey, you know what? Who cares, right? Uh, as long as you win the Super Bowl and you play the way that the Chiefs have played and coached the way they've coached and have the quarterback that they have, um, uh, this is uh, this is just something that you relish as a fan. This is a great uh, time to be a Chiefs fan. Uh, but still, it's all about uh, replenishing every year in the draft, uh, new players, uh, and especially the young ones. Um, and uh, overall – uh, you know, people can say what they want about Andy Reid uh, as a coach. And I remember a few years ago, uh, the talk was about um, Andy Reid was basically, he was like the man that was doing everything. This is Andy Reid's team. And, you know, yeah, they have a general manager, but uh, Andy Reid's really the one that's making all the decisions. But um, I'm sure he still is making a lot of them. But I would think it's more than anything time to recognize that it, it takes more than even just a head coach uh, or a quarterback. Uh, and uh, that's where it comes with great scouting, uh, the decisions on draft day and so forth. And um, and hopefully they've got another good class and another underrated class, uh, which I think they do. I think they have a very good class. Uh, I know you have a good grade on them. I have a good grade on them. Matter of fact, I thought the entire AFC West actually did a really good job in the draft this season. But the Chiefs uh, just keep on cooking. Yeah, uh, it, you know they they um they they pick their spots with these guys. Um, they've uh, they've really you know uh, found a great way to kind of balance need um, and you know uh, finding these guys in the draft. Um, and, and I think that's you know one thing that a lot of teams can kind of learn from. Like it's okay to have needs. You just have to have the ability to kind of adjust on the fly in the draft to be able to address those needs. Right. Um, but, you know, a lot of teams, they like to, and, and I know the chiefs like to, you know, position themselves so they don't have to feel that they have to pick based on need. And, um, you know, sometimes there are some external factors that, that play into it. And, you know, you know, a lot of people were through she rice stuff taking place this off season. It, is it going to be kind of like, you know, uh, what happened in the past with, um, with Michael Hardman when, you know, there were allegations that came out uh, against Tyree Kill, right? Um, and, and it felt kind of like the Chiefs were reacting to that almost in the draft. But I think this year, uh, even though they ended up selecting a wide receiver early, I, I think it was different. I think that wide receiver was always oh, yeah. um, that, that top need and always that uh, on the top of their radar, uh, something they were going to address early, no matter what happened, you know, regarding another player during the off season. hundred percent. And uh, we take a look now uh, here as I pop up the rleds.com depth chart for the Kansas city chiefs. Uh, and you can see right there, uh, all, all the players in orange, those are all the rookies. Uh, so you've got a lot of players, uh, including of course, the free agents that came up after the draft that were added on offense. Um, uh, and, and there are the defensive players. We'll get into that special teams and so on, but um, yeah, uh, let's uh, actually, but, Oh, by the way, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, not only if you're a chiefs fan, but just a general fan in general of the work we do here, 
make sure to subscribe to the channel. Um, so uh, you can return if you are a Chiefs fan at some point at training camp in the preseason because Charles is going to be back and we're going to have an opportunity to preview 2024 and go over uh, how the depth chart is looking uh, when we have an opportunity to find out more with camp and 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 so forth because this is just the start of things. Um, and I, it, would you say that because just taking a look at the depth chart here, our lads has just one player, a uh, big surprise, their first player uh, listed as a starter. So uh, when week one comes around, do you think that that's what it's going to be? That the Chiefs at this point in time. Uh, really, as far as this draft is concerned, and let's, I shouldn't even say week one. Let's just say, I should actually say my, maybe the end of the season. Do you think Worthy will probably still end up as the only guy considered like a, a true starter or somebody that's getting significant snaps? Or could you see more than just uh, Worthy being uh, a, a, a key part of the team this season? Yeah, I honestly can see um, the first four picks really playing those starting roles. Um, and, and slotting in as as starter esque, I, I should say, right? Um, I, I would say the one who actually probably has the the best chance right now is, is Kingsley Sumatia, um, the the left tackle. Uh, just yesterday, our uh, offensive line coach described the left tackle um, competition as wide open, and we you know kind of saw that in practice because they rotated a lot of guys in at that spot. Um, it, including, you know, someone I, I, I put you on to uh, last time we spoke, Chu Godrick was uh, was starting at, at left. Goal, and they actually moved one yes into left guard for some snaps there with uh, Joe Tooney out of practice. He's yep. still rehabbing the, the pec injury. So, it, you know, it, it's still very early, right? OTAs are a time for experimentation. You're finding out, like, what, what your guys can do, what they can do well, you know, where um, they can kind of slot in for you. You know, I, I don't know that, you know, Wanya Morris's future is at left guard, but, you know, knowing whether or not he can play that, that's important. You know, knowing how Chu Godrick handles going up against, you know, the opposing, you know, um, first team defense as a starting left tackle, that's important because, you know, we were talking about him last year. This is a guy that, that did, has never played professional football until yeah. the first preseason game last year. So, um, but, you know, obviously, you know, Kingsley is someone that they drafted with that left tackle job in mind, whether that happens this season or in the future is going to be up to him and, you know, how quickly he can kind of adapt and adjust and learn the playbook. And I really think that's where he's at right now. It was kind of funny. Um, uh, Andy uh, Andy Heck, the offensive line coach, made kind of a, a, a funny joke about when he was a player coming out. You know, he had a lot more difficult time learning pass protection because he was coming from like a wing T style offense. You know, <laughs> you ground and pound, run the football. Nowadays, you know, guys like Kingsley are much better suited coming out to pass protect because they come from that type of offense already. Yep. Uh, the college game is is very much so predicated on passing the football. So so I think he's going to be ready in that regard. It, it's going to be, you know, how quickly can they get him up to speed between the ears and, and how ready is he to, you know, contribute also in the run game too, because that's a, a big part of it. And, you know, obviously they're going to kind of figure that out until training camp comes around and they can put the pads on. Um, but I, I think Kingsley is probably an even better position right now than, than Worthy. Um, to contribute contribute uh, early and right away as as a starter, I, I mean I guess Worthy is someone that the Chiefs like also as a return specialist. Okay. Um, so he's someone who could maybe get like a starting punt returner type of job um, for for Kansas City and maybe more of um you know a um, gadget type of role uh, yep. as a receiver early on. Just get it, get uh, the ball in his hands. Yep. It, it, exactly and. You know, that's an important role in Andy Reid's offense, but I don't know if you necessarily would classify that as a starter. I, I mean, obviously, a lot of it's going to depend, too, on, you know, what happens with Rasheed Rice. Is, is Kadarius Tony or Sky Moore, are they still on the team? Or if some of these other guys stepped up, um, you know, a name that on, on on the depth chart here that I'd tell you to move up right now, just after uh, some some OTAs hype, Nico Remigio. Uh, he's, he's standing out um, quite a bit. Uh, yeah, so, someone who uh, 
potentially could uh, land land a spot on the roster um, if he keeps things up the way he has so far. Okay, and because uh, that is, if we just even start with the receivers with Worthy and the pick, taking a look at the the receiver the, the depth chart, it does look wide open uh, to me. You know, Watson's a guy that is, hey, he's a he's a steady veteran, and as long as we don't have, as long, until we find the the right guys, he'll do. That's how I take it. That they're looking at Watson is he'll he'll be okay. He he we he, we can count on him to do this that and the other thing, but we're looking for better. And 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 but until that happens, so what that means is it's open. And then you mentioned more. I mean, look at this point, it's been a major disappointment. So who knows if he's ever going to get it? I can't even believe Tony's still on the team to tell you the truth. So, but you would know that more than me. So that doesn't look like to me that it's a wide open room even for, say, that true number four spot, uh, which I got to believe right now is Watson's over yeah. more. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, R- R- you're telling me that Remigio uh, has the opportunity at this point in time that is he, if he has a really good summer, that he might be able to fit that role. Yeah, and, and the nice thing, too, is he had a really good year uh, last year. Had like 71 yards in his first preseason game, comes back the next week, at training camp practice makes a incredible athletic grab in training camp and at the same time injures himself, ends yes. up on season ending injury reserve, gets the red shirt year. And, you know, now he's back. He's hungry. He wants more. Um, and, and look, you, you mentioned it with Watson, right? Uh, the chiefs had of him on a two year deal uh, last year. It was difficult to get out of that deal this year. There's no dead money. They, they can, they can, you know, cut ties. So, um, I, I think, you know, that's something to, to keep in mind too. Um, you know, as these guys get out there and compete that it, it is very much so, uh, anyone's game. Um, you know, a guy like Justin Ross, who had a, a really good off season last year and then just kind of disappeared once the regular season arrived, yep. you know, is he a guy who can, can step it up? Cornell Powell hasn't got a lot of opportunities, but he's been very consistent during his time in Kansas city. Uh, and I have to wonder, you know, will he get some chances? Montreal Washington's doing some nice things with the second team, um, you know, c- catching some some long passes from Carson Wentz. So, I mean, there are definitely some guys um, who who could who could push some of these guys who are kind of fringe players um, f- for a spot. Yeah. And um, you know, and then the the other thing you have to consider, uh, like with Worthy, is special teams value because this year with the new kick return rules and whatnot, guys who play special teams and fill those roles on special teams, they are going to have more value than the guys who don't. So, um, yeah, that that's that's also something to consider. But by, by the way. Um... I know we're having like a, I don't know, a little bit of a connection issue here and there, just so you know. <laughs> but um, the for dra- fantasy fans, what do you think? Because you, again, it, it, and I know it's early, because this is something maybe for the next conversation. But Rice, how confident are you that everything's just going to be okay? And that yeah. hey, you know what? I'm going to draft Rishi Rice on my team this year at a certain area in the draft. I don't know if you play fantasy or not, but what would you say to them? You know, I I think it's just, um, it's interesting. I I would, you know, obviously monitor his, um, you know, his his rankings and whatnot, what his average draft position is, um, because I do think he's going to play at some point uh, this next season. I don't think that, you know, it's going to be a situation where he indefinitely ends up on the commissioner's exempt list or, um, whatnot. I, I, I honestly, you know, I've heard a lot of people who are kind of saying six, eight games, half the season, what, what, what have you. I would be surprised if it's going to be that. Obviously, the second incident turned out to be kind of a nothing, right? Um, the first incident is is extremely serious, right? Um, however, I, I feel like it, if the NFL were to hand out like a, a six or eight game suspension. I feel like there is precedent for him to, to come and have the NFLPA represent him and appeal a suspension like that and get it down significantly. Um, so I, I just think that um, I, I think that the league's going to kind of fall maybe on three to four games for, for rice at the end of the day. And okay. um, 
I, I think that that that'll be fair, um, just based on the fact that he's kind of a, a first time offender here, and um, you know, this is this is just uh, you know, it's it's obviously something that you know you don't want to see that happen. You want to make sure that you're treating that properly, um, but at, at the same time, it, there is that precedent. At, like I said, um, with things that have happened in the past and. We do know that Roger Goodell and, and the NFL has kind of, you know, strayed from that from time to time and can kind of do what they want. But I, I don't think yeah. that's going to be a situation here. Okay. Yeah, we're looking at our, 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 our fantasy partners at Draft Sharks, their latest rankings. And they're, their number one receiver on Kansas City right now is Xavier Worthy. So now this is Dynasty. So yes. that's obviously a little bit different. Um, but still. And, and I, I think that's right. the- I, I think that's the right call too. I, I would rank him ahead of Rice in, in dynasty rankings. Um, just the the speed. I mean, we've seen what Patrick Mahomes can do with you know the passing attack. Just throw the ball for a guy to run under it and catch it. Um, so I, I feel like it, yeah, potentially yeah. Um, if I had to choose one guy, uh, it, it would be worthy. Um, you know, he's obviously he's going to have the fifth year option too. So, you know, you at least know he's going to be in the system probably there for five years um, at a minimum. And with the way the, the wide receiver market is now, I think they'll probably take that fifth year option <laughs> instead of trying to, instead of trying to, to pay him a contract. But um, yeah, it, it's just, uh, I, I think worthy, you know, very, very extremely talented. The, the big thing that keeps coming up about him too, is that, you know, he's a smart kid. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and that's something I think that the Chiefs value um, and, and have shown that they're looking for out of the wide receiver position. I think they saw what kind of transpired with Rasheed Rice last season, and you know um, how he was able to pick up the offense and, and really have an impact quickly. And I think they've kind of learned how they can the types of players they're looking for, the types of guys who can come in and maybe replicate that. And I think worthy someone like that. And, you know, I know that there's um, a lot of anxiety right now because he hasn't been practicing at, at OTAs. He, uh, he pr- had one and a half practices and, um, you know, pulled, pulled up lame, had a hamstring and, you know, uh, people are kind of concerned that he hasn't been back at, at practice yet. Okay. Um, however, um, it's a it's a minor thing. Andy Reid okay. called it a tweak. They're they're just holding them out to be safe. They want him on the field for the part of the off season that matters. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he'll be back for you know OTA practices next next week. I, I'd actually probably guess he's not. I would say mandatory mini camp is what they're aiming for right now to get him on the field for that. Okay. Um, you know, and, and that'll be kind of the thing that'll springboard him into training camp, which is really where they want him, you know, on the field and working and, and getting that chemistry with Patrick Mahomes, but doesn't mean he's not working right now. They got him on the side every day at practice and they've got the wide receiver coach or an assistant right there next to him. And, you know, they'll, they'll have him on a given play. They're like, okay, you're the zebra receiver on this play. What's your responsibility? What, what, what are you supposed to do on this play? And, and he regurgitates that information to the coach right or right or wrong, you know, he'll get the answer from the coach and, you know, have to go hit the playbook again, but <laughs> yeah. he's taking these mental reps, um, you know, even though he's not out there on the field and, and that can be valuable too. Um, I, I do think there is maybe a little bit more value to being out there and actually, you know, going through the rep and running it yourself and sure. And what have you. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, that there, there is some, some good things happening, even though he's not on and, and then we're going to find out a lot more, of course, about this whole unit as we get uh, to training camp in our next in our next conversation, more than likely. But before we move on from wide receiver, I, look, Hollywood Brown was added to the team. They got to be really excited there. Uh, I know he's a little older, but he's not old. Uh, he's in the prime of his career, and this could be a very, uh, maybe even underrated. Because everybody's, of course, Rice, they was excited about. Worthy, they're all excited about this year. And then here's Hollywood Brown under the radar coming on right. in. And he could have a monster season. Uh, yeah. 
with, uh, with, 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 with Mahomes, especially with the deep ball. So we're going to keep an eye on that. But Sky Moore, before we move on, what's your gut tell you between now and the time that we do talk again? Anything going to change? Do you think your opinion is going to be the same? Uh, or do you think, hey, you know, keep an eye on, you know, I think Sky Moore, you know, maybe this could be a good year for him. And this is the reason why. Yeah, I think that um, Sky is always going to have a role that he can play. I don't know that he's ever going to be a star. I, I don't know he's ever going to be the guy that you're relying on. He's your number one. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it, it's tough to, to really say right now uh, because it's just so early. Okay. I, I, I would reckon that he'll be on the team um, and, and, you know, they'll they'll have a, a role for him. I just <laughs> – I couldn't tell you what that is yet. Can <laughs> um, they trade him? I, I mean, I think that's a possibility too. He could be one of those guys who maybe it's just a, a change of scenery, a, a different opportunity. Um, I, I think, you know, I don't know if it's a matter of expectations, you know, kind of overwhelming him or, or whatnot. Um, you know, he had, I, I think, you know, practice that was open to the media this week. There was a drop that was mentioned that people were kind of, um, you know, kind of yikes about <laughs> they were they were a little like, ooh. I mean, that could have been one of those plays, but I, I think um, it, he he's one of those guys that if he does stick around, I feel like he's going to come up big for the team in a couple moments where it, they're going to be vindicated for making that decision. Okay, um, I, I think that that he's the type of guy who's going to you know thrive as the season progresses and you know kind of the dog days and you know maybe it's just one of those games where they have a couple of guys who are banged up and they need someone who's reliable, who's been in the system, who knows things. And, you know, all of a sudden he gets that great matchup and he goes off for uh, 145 yards and a couple of TDs. And suddenly, uh, you know, everyone's singing Sky Moore's praises. Right. Okay. But, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, he, he's not someone that, that I would necessarily move on from yet. Even if he does have kind of some, some yips or a, a tough uh, off season, uh, competing this year. What's holding him back the most? Is there one thing holding him back the most, or is it just a you know? He, he, again, it's just a variety of things, and I think, matter you know. of, I think it's a matter of finding just a, a defined role for him. Um, you know, I think that it, they, they kind of initially envisioned him kind of in like that that slot type of role, working across the middle of the field. Um, you know, kind of kind of the Juju Smith Schuster role. Um, and, and I think that with Rasheed Rice kind of stepping in to that role last season, it kind of you know um, put him at a disadvantage. Uh, um, so now now it's trying to find okay, you know, can he you know fill in elsewhere? Is he the guy who's going to step in for Rice if Rice is suspended? Um, you know, can he you know become a deep threat? W where can you use some of his route running prowess and and what? What are the types of routes that he can run that, you know, you need that that type of help? Okay. Uh, Want to uh, let everybody know who is watching uh, live. If you have any questions or comments, uh, you can let us know, and then we can, uh, uh, you know, retort and get back and forth there. Uh, if you're watching on demand, uh, same thing. It's just not going to be happening live, but we will definitely respond, and I'll forward any questions or comments that you have over to Charles uh, from uh, our last channel. Um, and he can answer them for you if he wants to. I mean, that's just Charles. He's got a busy schedule. So, you know. Uh, all right. So uh, what I did notice about this draft class, seven, seven, seven players. So uh, three of those, of course, are the offensive line. But what I also noticed, and we talked about Kingsley already, is that all of these guys have one similar trait, one, one, one key similar trait. They're all athletic linemen. And so if you want to know what the Chiefs are looking for in the offensive line, all you have to do is check out the profiles of these three linemen and athlete sticks out more than anything. And where do you find that right here in the R lads draft guide. So even if you haven't purchased this yet and you're thinking, well, why would I do it? If the draft is over, well, this is the perfect time anyway, because now you know where all these players are, including on your own team. And you have a few that are free agents too. So not only, not only is every, all seven of the draft picks uh, in this guide, but you also have uh, several of the free agents that we're going to get get that we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, the reason I'm talking to Charles at this time is actually because of this. 
the draft review guide that'll be out in 2024. This is last year's. Not sure who's going to be on the cover uh, yet for 2024. If you have any suggestions, let us know. But uh, this was last year. I'm going to take uh, what Charles uh, is going to give me here, and I am going to add in my own uh, two cents and then put my report in the guide. So you can check that out as part of uh, one of 32 team draft reviews that we're going to uh, have. Uh, so you can get both the review guide and the draft guide at our lads.com. Okay. So let's uh, talk about those uh, linemen. Uh, you mentioned Kingsley already. And um, the one thing, I mean, I don't know what you found out about yeah, it, but when I, what, what was that? I, I was going to say, if you recall when we spoke ahead of the draft, I, I believe I listed Offensive line is like my number one. Need. Oh yeah, and, and I specifically cited interior offensive line too, with all the departures and the and the future needs that they had. So yes, um, I wasn't I wasn't surprised, and anyone who watched that wouldn't have been surprised to to kind of see that uh, transpire. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, let's see, because obviously, because I put the report out uh, for the Chiefs in the draft review guide, and again, same thing. Uh, the information I was able to get from you went in here. Um, and, uh, I don't know if they can see it here, but, uh, let's see, where is it? Yeah. I'm not sure it might be too, too small, but right here, offensive line, top need. There we go. So, <laughs> and I didn't come up with that myself. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so, uh, Charles, uh, uh, obviously knew what he was talking about and I was smart enough to, uh, put that in there as their number one need. So, all right. Uh, so then they, oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about Kingsley because doing when, when you're doing the extra work on him, you know, I see him as a five star and, uh, you know, you, BYU, it's always a strange kind of deal because you go on these missions and stuff and your career is interrupted and all that kind of stuff. But what, what, which, which, but you also see a guy that only started for a couple of years. So you go, well, five star, a lot of teams wanted him. What, shouldn't he have been starting from day one? This is BYU, this ain't Alabama. You know, why wasn't this guy maybe more productive? So, um, but hey, he ended up as a second round draft pick. So it's not like we're talking about a guy that was a fourth or fifth round guy. It's still, you were a second round draft pick. You got talent. Um, what did you notice most importantly? Uh, because he's got the power. He has the size. He has the athleticism. So he's got it all. But what do you notice more, more than anything else regarding the traits that he has that you think is going to be uh, – useful to the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, you know, I, I think I mean obviously the, the stuff with um you know his recruiting and um and and when I think he started I want to say he started at Oregon, then he ended up uh at BYU if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um and um you know obviously he's got um you know the bloodlines right uh he, he's got uh his cousin uh Sewell over in uh well, he's got three three cousin Sewells in the NFL. I think uh, you know two linebackers and the offensive tackle in uh, in Detroit, and then um, you know uh, his his uh, grandfather, and so he's got a long history of um, you know uh, of people playing professional football in his family. Um, so there's there's that aspect of it. Obviously, Andy Reid, you know, being a BYU alum. Um, you know, he has kind of the inside track to find out about the kid. And good point. Oh, you froze, Charles. I told you we were having a little minor issues. Are you okay there, Charles? You, you coming I think, back? I think oh, I'm you back. You froze there. Yeah, you're back. Good. Okay. <laughs> Is everything uh, okay there? You got too yeah, many browsers open? What's up? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I, okay. I've been having some Wi-Fi issues lately. Oh, have so you? Okay. Apologize. <laughs> That's okay, we're you're but, back. Um, anyhow, well, like I was saying, um, you know, the Chiefs did a lot of homework on Kingsley, and uh, I, I think they're really comfortable and confident. I mean, there was even some some buzz that they might have selected him at the end of the first round, um, in in a certain scenario, and they get him kind of right there at the end of the the second round. And I think they're pretty happy with that. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, strong, strong athlete, obviously, is a big thing. Um, you know, he had the the really good season at right tackle and kind of switched to left uh, this last year. That was kind of, um, you know, a, a, a little touch and go. And um, 
I, I, I know there were some things that went on um, with the offensive line coach at BYU that, that uh, you know, that there was some, uh, some I, I don't know what the right word to say is, but some disagreements and whatnot in the room. And um, I, I think that, you know, uh, Kingsley showed enough playing left tackle that last year that you feel comfortable that, that, that he's a guy who can transition and play that in the pros. Um, and, and it doesn't hurt that he has the capability to kind of switch and play right tackle. Sure. Uh, yeah. you know uh you know potentially in the future because you always like to have that flexibility that ability to yep. uh you know move guys around uh when necessary but uh, i think you know developmental left tackle of the future is kind of where they're plugging him in right now and you know whether he starts this year or plays kind of a backup role to whoever earns the starting job remains to be seen sure yeah um it's going to be a great competition though that's, yeah. that's uh, you, so those three. You, do you seriously say that right now, all three of those kids are on equal ground? Do you believe that to be true, or do you think there's a pecking order right now? Yeah, I think, um, and, and um, the the offensive line coach Andy Heck even admitted this. You know, obviously, Wanya Morris mm-hmm. and Kingsley are two guys that would have a step up o- over some of the others because their their draft status, their experience, and what have you. Um, but I don't think they're they're ready to make those decisions yet. I think they are legitimately going to give guys chances, and okay. you know, regardless of draft status. And I, I think that goes for you know, really all five spots on the offensive line. <laughs> and you know, they always are, um, you know, um, I guess uh, saying put the five best guys out there, right? And um, we'll see if the five best from last year are kind of the five five best this year, but. Um, it, it, it always can be different. There are things that can come into play. You know, Joe Tooney's recovering from the pec injury. So maybe, you know, if he's still dealing with some stuff there, maybe you plug someone else in to give him some extra time. Um, maybe you run into some injury issues during the, the preseason and you got to plug someone else in there. So, you know, um, having a, a good depth of talent, um, you know, and, and having some of these other guys who can, kind of um, pop in and out and play a couple different positions. I, I know specifically the interior offensive line, you know, um, Hunter Nurzad's a guy that they kind of uh, envision as a Nick Allegretti replacement, a guy who can play okay. left guard, he can play center, he can play right guard. Oh, yeah. Um, so he has those those three interior offensive line positions probably, you know, locked down. And, and then CJ Hansen is a guy that they really liked as well that, that they saw at the East West Shrine Bowl. And, um, you know, uh, obviously he's coming from uh, Holy Cross, a, a smaller school, one that doesn't have uh, many players drafted. In fact, the last time a player from Holy Cross was drafted, it was uh, it was the Kansas City Chiefs back in the, I believe, uh, 89 uh, or wow. 90, one of, the, one of those years. So it's a long time, right? Um, they had another player, I think it was the receiver maybe. I don't think he was drafted this year, though. Uh, no, he wasn't drafted, no. but he's a player that uh, Dave. I, I know when I was uh, speaking to uh, the insider on that video that he felt this is a guy to watch. Yeah. So yeah, uh, must have been a big season for Holy Cross last year. Yeah, uh, I think it's um, uh, Co- Coker. Coker, I think is his yes, name. Coker, uh, correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, yeah. Anyhow. Um, but I, I think that, you know, these two guys, um, you know, can be kind of those, uh, backup interior offensive linemen this season and yeah. potentially when they have some departures, I, I don't know that they're going to play, pay a guy like Trey Smith, the, the market rate for, uh, guards after this past off season. I don't know that, you know, I mean, Creed Humphrey, that's also another guy who's yeah. going to be paid at top of market. So do you pay both those guys? I, I, that's, you know, a question. Joe Tooney's going to be coming up on a contract year um, in 2025. So do you extend him? Do you find, uh, you know, someone else? So, I, I mean, they're going to have some decisions to make there and how some of these guys perform, um, some of the draft picks perform, and, the, and even some of the undrafted free agents could potentially, um, you know, be uh, uh, something interesting there. Uh, another thing I found interesting, um, Griffin McDowell, who you have at, at left tackle, um, I think he – so he trans uh, transitioned. He played tight end uh, and then at, at Florida, and then he transferred to Chattanooga, and he played tackle at Chattanooga. The Chiefs are playing him at center. 
Um, okay. I've been playing him at center, and he kind of has a similar uh, athletic profile and build as former uh, chief center Mitch Morris, who's now with the Buffalo Bills. So that's a developmental guy that that I worthy of watching is maybe like one of those guys who could, you know, maybe stick around in the practice squad is still pretty raw learning a position. And, and then, you know, a year from now be a, a very valuable depth piece or even slot in as you know, a, a surprising starter. Okay. So, and you mentioned, so we got McDowell, uh, Torres, uh, uh, Meta hour. Uh, hour. Yeah. And then Driscoll. So, Driscoll. Is Driscoll he, is, is an interesting player, too. I mean, he's someone who's uh, getting some shots uh, in the, the tackle competition. Uh, on, on the left side, he's also playing some some right tackle as well. Um, uh, Midauer um, obviously comes from the, the Oklahoma tree there, and the Chiefs tend to really like their offensive linemen from Oklahoma. <laughs> um, Torres, very intriguing athlete, uh, played tackle, I believe, for Villanova. Um and now they're sliding him in at guard. So, I mean, they, they have a lot of depth there, a lot of obviously new players. I mean, you know, you can see just from looking at your depth chart here, a lot of, a lot of orange in the offensive line room uh, yes. compared to some of these other positions. So, um, you know, that's something that you, you worry. Um, you don't, you don't worry so much about it though. Um, when you know that, you know, you've had some, some good success bringing up some of these rookies quickly um, with guys like Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith in the past. Um, so I, I think it's going to be, a, that, that's going to be a fun one, fun room to watch. I'm really interested to see who ends up kind of settling in as that second string offensive line, um, even behind the starters. Cause that can really kind of tell you, you know, who they're looking at as you know, that there's potential depth players for the future. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, there is a scouting report in the draft guide on Driscoll. So uh, he had a projected potential round of uh, the fifth, as high as the fifth. So yep. uh, they thought he could have been uh, a fifth round draft pick. And, and and Brett Veach agreed. He said that, uh, you know, they were actually considering him l- late in the draft and, you know, round six, round seven. That's when you, they started kind of thinking, hey, is this like a guy that, that we go and draft right now? Right. Um, he was someone who was kind of highly rated on their board and, was one of the priority free agents that they really, uh, really were happy that they were able to get. Big, big dude. Yeah, six foot nine. Uh, he, he's he's a big guy. Wow. Okay. So there you go. So I believe uh, those are the two guys. Well, so if I had to really just point at uh, two of the four, um, look, I mean, it could be all four, but you know, we, we try to. Um, uh, bring it down a little bit uh but if uh just saying you know not everybody is is a realistic uh roster guy um but would you say driscoll mcdowell would be two the top two out of those four yeah i would say those would be the top two to watch out of those four um okay you know the four undrafted free agents right now Okay. All right. So uh, th- that is the offensive line, which again, took a, a lot of what this draft was about. Uh, we now stay on offense for one more pick and that's Jared Wiley. And I'll say this, uh, I had it in my mind uh, for uh, quite a long time during my rookie draft. Uh, our first one actually in the dynasty league that we started last year of, Hey, you know what? I need, I need a developmental tight end guy on my team. And I think Wiley would be really perfect. And I, it, I just, I just never got around to taking him, but it was somebody I was really thinking about. And actually, uh, the guy that did take him, uh, who is the editor over at the Falcoholic, um, uh, Kevin Knight, who, who covers the Atlanta Falcons, he has uh, Travis Kelsey on his team. So he took Jared Wiley. So that made a lot of sense uh, yeah. for his dynasty team. But I mentioned that only because of the fact that if you look at it, he didn't get the name recognition, obviously, of some of the other players like Brock Bowers and so forth. Uh, we get that. And it's not like he made a name for himself in college. Get that. But when he just looked at it, he was like, hey, you know what? Uh, d- this guy looks like he's somebody that uh, is exactly what you're looking for as far as an, you know, an ascending player with his best football ahead of him that could fit really nicely into maybe being the guy that does take over for Travis Kelsey whenever that is. Yeah. And, you know, I think you, you kind of look at them and they come from like a, it's a similar background, right? Former quarterback turned tight end. Um, 
it, it seems like they're very much so cut from the same cloth. And, um, you know, I, I look at Wiley and I, I feel like, you know, he might be the one who benefits most from a Rasheed Rice suspension because I, I wonder if the Chiefs won't maybe run a little bit more 12 personnel when, you know, they don't have Rasheed Rice and, you know, you get a guy like Travis Kelsey and a guy like Jared Wiley on the field at the same time. Um, that That's, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of potential um, with, with that type of look. And, you know, what, what we're hearing from, uh, you know, OTAs about Wiley is that, you know, he's coming from a system this last year. And mind you, he had five different offenses that he had to learn during the course of his college career. Um, so this is his sixth offense that he's learned in the last six years. Um, however, this last offense at TCU has a lot of similar concepts okay. um, to, to what the Chiefs run. There's just a lot of different terminology. So it's kind of rewiring um, your brain. Like you already know how to do this, but you got to remember that it's not called, you know, a banana. It's called an orange, you know, yeah, right? Sure. Like, yeah, much like, easier. Like, yes. Right. So um, it, it's just um, it, it's one of those things that that yeah you know, with, with time he's getting fast, sure he's getting uh, able to kind of regurgitate that information quicker and move quicker, and you know I think by the end of camp that he's a guy that that could really um, sprout and you know potentially be right behind Travis Kelsey on the depth chart there. Yeah. Uh... And, and this is important to note, taking a look at the stats from last year, that the Chiefs uh, were one of the top teams that combined to run both 12 and 13 personnel. So um, I believe they ran about 12% 13, 27% 12, uh, and of course 13 is three tight ends and 12 is two. Uh, so they, they use multiple tight ends quite a bit compared to a lot of other teams in the league. And, and, and also maybe not a surprise that Irv Smith uh, was also brought on board um, as a veteran who just has never been able to live up uh, to the hype with injuries and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, it should be also a very interesting uh, tight end competition with Smith, Wiley, and Gray. Right. And I do see a situation where maybe they keep all four, right? Um, obviously, the new kick return rules, we mentioned them earlier. Um, they're going to have to have a lot of different players who can play different roles, whether it's, um, you know, on the return team or the coverage team. And, um, you know, they're not necessarily the same types of players that they're formerly uh, looking for, you know, with the old kickoffs, right? You're looking for, you know, players who can get down the field quickly and whatnot. Now you need guys who can stack and shed blocks and, you know, um, and, and can move guys off the, off of their spot and whatnot. So, um, you know, you have a play that's looking a lot more like run blocking versus play that has, you know, a lot of these smaller guys trying to get down the field as quickly as possible. So um, it, 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 you're going to need different types of players. So maybe you keep one less um, cornerback and you keep one extra tight end. Um, that's, you know, there, there's definitely potential for, you know, different ways to organize your roster now that this new rule is in place. Oh, yeah. That's gonna. That's everybody's talking about regarding how it could be. How do you take advantage of it? And 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 I don't think I don't. I'm not sure. It's be interesting to find out after the fact what some of these coaches say because everybody's saying we don't know what to expect. And I know most of those people are media. We don't know what to expect. But you do get. I mean. I mean. Look, this is their job. That's what they do every day, every second, devise ways. And if you got it, okay, this is what I understand that we can do is what they tell us. These are the new rules. These guys, they know. It's just a matter of who's going to be the one to be more creative about it and take advantage of it. And we're the ones that are going to have no idea until we see a first game, maybe even, of course, in the preseason before we kind of, oh, that's what it looks like. Oh, that's what they've been talking. That's how, now I understand. Um, and maybe we'll start getting some of that in the preseason. Uh, before I move on from the offense, let's just talk about these running backs as well, because I know they didn't draft any, but I think it's important, especially for any dynasty fans out there. Uh, you're probably not going to take these guys, of course, in their draft, but keep an eye on them in the preseason. You might want to snatch one if all of a sudden they've had a really good summer, they're having a really good camp, and we're talking about Bailey and Steele, even though Bailey is the one maybe to watch more. Bailey, the R-Lads had him graded as a fifth-round 
uh, uh, talent. So he's in this, he's, he's got a scout. We got a scouting report of him in the guide. Uh, what I noticed from him, even though he's only five, seven, uh, he was top 10 nationally and missed tackles forced. He's got excellent hands. And that's a room that when you see Clyde Edwards Hilaire as the number two running back and you know, Pacheco's injury history because of how hard he runs, not that he's injury prone or, you know, he's one of those guys, just that he's, we all know he just runs so violently that he's going to miss games here and there. And so that number two job is really important. And after Prince was the talk last year, uh, you know, and then even you take a look at um, uh, this class that's coming in, I think Bailey and or Steele, they have legitimate chances to make this team. And if one of them really just makes their mark, they could be part of the rotation. Yeah. I was just talking about this room with um, Craig Stout, uh, uh, formerly of KC Sports Network. He just kind of retired from his main role over there. Um, but I was talking to him over lunch uh, today about this room. And it's so interesting because you've got Pacheco at the top seventh round draft pick. You got Clyde first round draft pick and everybody else undrafted free agents. I think uh, Ingram is like a fifth round pick. And then you got Reese Samet, who is like never played football before international. (laughs) Right. It's just a very weird room. Um, I think it kind of reflects like the climate surrounding running backs a little bit though. um, And how they've become devalued. Um, I do think, you know, the name to, to move up a little bit right now, uh, Daneric Prince, again, he's taken like some, some first team, second team reps in, in OTAs. Um, so, you know, that's a guy who they liked a lot last year. He sat on the bench. He was called up for two games. He played about 12 snaps on special teams, no snaps on offense, but he did everything the coaches asked of him. Um, and you know, now I, I feel like, you know, you get a year like that where you're sitting on the bench a lot and now you're kind of getting rewarded for it with an opportunity. And, uh, I think, you know, obviously in OTAs, he, he took advantage of that opportunity last year. There was a lot of hype coming out of his pass catching ability and whatnot. And, um, I think, you know, can you recreate that hype in a training camp environment once the pads come on? Cause I do think he's going to get an opportunity to, um, to, to still have that, that, um, you know, first, second team type type role and, and get in there okay. and work in there. Um, beyond that, Keontae Ingram is a guy who, who obviously, um, the, the chiefs brought on late last year on the practice squad, um, you know, played with the Cardinals uh, for a little bit, former, uh, running back out of, uh, USC, uh, someone that the chiefs liked when he was coming out of the draft. I know Brett Veach is still very high on him, spoke highly of him after the draft as, as a guy who could potentially fit in there. Um, I, I think that, you know, what, what we've seen over the years for, from the Chiefs, you know, last year, they were content with cutting Daneric Prince and letting him chance it on waivers and signing him to the practice squad eventually. I, I think for guys like Steele and Bailey, unless they really, really have a standout camp, I think that's the path they're on I really do. I think they're going to, you know, chance it uh, with, with releasing them, finding, figuring out which one they can get on the practice squad. And boom. Um, I, I feel like for a guy like Reese Samet, is he going to be ready to play running back super early? I don't know, but he's got some crazy value for this team right now. They're using him in so many different ways. They've got him as kicking off as a kicker, right? They've got him kicking off as a kicker. Okay. Right? They've got him returning kicks and punts and they've got him working in receiver and and running back so so they're they're working him a lot and mind you he's taking first team repetitions as uh the kick and punt returner because they want him to get as many repetitions as possible um interesting they're seeing him as someone who can potentially be um a bit of a cheat code with the new kick return rules and whatnot okay. Um, and, and someone who obviously he hasn't played a lot of football before, right? But it, you know, no one has played with these new kick return rules before. So getting him as a mainstay and that, you know, he's on the same level as everybody else, even though he hasn't played football his whole life, like most everyone else on the football team has. Um, it, he's someone who's on that same level when when he's out there, you know, whether it's uh, you know kick coverage, whether he's kicking off whether uh, he's uh, acting as a returner uh, or, or blocking and whatnot. So 
I think he's a guy like if they end up keeping like four running backs on the 53 man roster, I think he's a guy who could be that number four guy. Interesting. Okay. Uh, now let's, uh, by the way, just uh, steal uh, had over 3,200 yards rushing in three years, two of those with ball state uh, 26 touchdowns, 58 receptions. Uh, and uh, I, I know he's, he's also, has, I believe he has fumbling problems. I know that. <laughs> He's got a pet alligator named Crocky J. That's all I need to know about and him. And <laughs> he has a pet alligator. So <laughs> maybe that's all you need to know, right? right? All right. So we'll see how that works out. And who knows? If, if, if Prince doesn't work out or Ingram doesn't work out this year, then next year maybe Bailey and Steele will be in their shoes uh, during camp. So like you said, makes a lot of sense. Why, you know, Prince and Ingram, they're a little bit older. So they've got pro experience. And uh, they should be. That's why it's a depth chart. They're ahead of them for a reason. And as long as Prince and Ingram uh, continue to play uh, well enough to, to hold on to those roles, that's probably what will happen. Okay. Um, but by the way, uh, last thing, Prince definitely, um, it, it, it would, you give him a really good shot to be the number two running back this year? I, I think there's a possibility that he could jump in in that number two spot. I think it's, it's going to come down to pass protection, you know, can he pass protect better than, than Clyde and um, you know, whether or not he can get those, those run concepts down, okay. uh, you know, to, to a T because they, it wasn't there last year with the, with the run game. All right. Now on defense, uh, there were a couple of players that they added and uh, they were both in the secondary. So you had uh, Hicks and Hayden coming in. Uh, Hicks was somebody that could have gone as early as round two. So, matter of fact, I believe four or, or five players that the Chiefs drafted, uh, our lads felt could have gone earlier, a, a couple of rounds earlier. So, that's good. That's really yep. good drafting when you can get guys a, a, a round or two later than expected. And uh, Hicks is one of them. So, the thing with Hicks is his versatility. Um He's got good size for the position, which you which you like for either position. Do you think that they have like a specific role for him uh, already, or are they just going to use that versatility and say, okay, you know, w- let's just use him? Um, and 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 the versatility is basically going to give us an opportunity to uh, disguise our defenses better that way. Yeah, I, I think I think they do have a role in mind. It, it's going to be interesting. Um, Dave Merritt described him as the prototype safety. For, for the team the other day. Um, however, um, he, he also kind of admitted and, and as did Steve Spagnuolo that, you know, he, he still got to get the playbook down and whatnot. Um, that, that's kind of the part of it and where he's at right now. I think they believe he's got the, the athletic ability and, and he's got everything between the ears that they need. It's just a matter of mastering that part of it. Um, right. and, and that'll come down to, you know, how quickly he can kind of contribute there. I just think it's interesting, you know, um, Shamari Connor, uh, who you have listed on, as strong safety here, he's a guy who's playing nickel now. Uh, oh, he is? In. Okay. He's, he's playing nickel. He's playing the slot uh, for the Chiefs. He's kind of their number one guy uh, and has been this year. Um, and, and I think that's kind of interesting. He's kind of more of a, not as outspoken, kind of a quieter guy. And um, I, I think that that's, you know, potentially one of the reasons that they're moving him to nickels because they're they're um guys in the the safety room to be outspoken they need their guys to to be loud because they kind of they, they really control the defense um for for steve spagnolo so okay um and, and you know um the fact of, of the stuff surrounding the, the kick return rules i keep coming back to this right justin reed right now is doing kickoffs he's their number one kickoff guy no longer Harrison Bunker. It's Justin Reed doing kickoffs for the, for the Chiefs. Okay. New, yeah, with this new kickoff rules, which is great. They they want to have an extra tackler on the field. They they don't want to have a guy like Butker having to get into you know twenty to thirty percent of the plays where where you know the kicker's going to have to tackle a guy with these new rules. So, so that that's legit. That's that legit. They legitimately right now. Justin Reed is the number one kickoff guy. He, he, for this is, team. he is the number one kickoff guy for this team. They're wow. still going to use Butker, I think, in certain situations. Like 
if they are at the end of the game and say they don't want to risk a kickoff return, they want to take a touchback and, you know, surrender the extra five yards that you do by, you know, kicking a touchback. Um, they'll, they'll bring Bucker out cause he's got the leg yeah. uh, to, to boot it. I mean, Justin does too, but um, I, I think they'll still use Bucker in certain situations, but I, I think Justin's one of those main guys and, you know, with having him on all those plays that, you know, brings up another opportunity. Okay. Maybe Hicks can slot in and play a little bit more early. Um, alongside Brian Cook, who's you know coming back from injury, he looks really good. By the way, uh, coming okay. back from injury, you got Trey Dean, who's also taking reps with the second team. You've got Deion Bush, who they trust uh, very much. So I, I think this could be a team that sees a lot of safeties <laughs> making the roster. To be honest with you, well, you uh, liked uh, you talked about the kid um, uh, Boydo. Uh, yeah. Uh, How you pronounce his name? Ikel yes, Boydo. Boydo. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as, a, then, as a cornerback, um, yeah, yeah, and also a, a special teamer. He's good, a uh, 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 punt gunner. Um, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like that is one uh, area that other teams are going to be looking at and find out. All right, who are the Chiefs going to cut, or who are they going to leave vulnerable on the practice squad? That's how it right. works. Okay. Right. So, and then the other kid, Kamal uh, Haddon. So yeah. Haddon. Uh, coming over uh, just one year as a starter, but that's because his, uh, well, he, you know, he, he started then uh, last year he had the injury and it was bad timing because he was He's just really good. starting. Yeah. He yeah. was just starting to get it. Yeah. He, he was really good uh, last season, the games he played. And yeah, I think the chiefs um, kind of envision him as a, as a developmental type, uh, someone they can kind of bring along uh, and, and potentially have, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I think Dave Merritt, he compared him to Bashad Breeland, um, who, who the Chiefs had uh, wow. for, okay. for several seasons. He was part of the Super Bowl, uh, the, the first Super Bowl team, um, the LIV team. But, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, um, press is something that he's going to have to work on, something he's going to have to learn. Um, but, yeah, he, he's, he's someone who's definitely intriguing. Um, another cornerback that that I can put on your radar, Kelvin Joseph, who's the former second round pick by uh, the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, uh, he, was, he was getting some first team action recently. He started saw, saw him getting second team action that first week, and he's kind of, I think, uh, proven himself enough that they're giving him some some earlier reps there, which uh, is interesting because, you know, obviously he's got the the second round pedigree. So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's fascinating. But uh, yeah, we'll, that uh, is. we'll see. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, and look, that this is definitely the time of year where it happens. Uh, but they're just not going to stick guys into those spots just to do it. They've obviously uh, seen something in these kids and why they're giving them these opportunities. And uh, we'll see if they can take advantage of it. Okay. Right. And and there's a couple of guys too. I mean, Brian Cook hasn't seen the field yet. He's coming back from the ankle injury. Nazi Johnson coming back from the the knee injury. Those are guys that I fully expect to be right in the mix for, for starting jobs, um, at Cook especially. But Nazi uh, last year, he was tracking to start, you know, opposite um, Sneed and McDuffie. So that's a guy who could, you know, if he comes back and his uh, he trusts his knee and um, is, is back in the swing of things, I mean, he's a guy who can make some noise too. Okay. So – uh, first, I just want to because I didn't ask you for a grade. I think uh, I don't think you gave a grade, right? Uh, you might have given it to me off the air, but um, we both feel that they're they've had a, a good draft. Did you give them uh, what an A, A minus, A minus? Yeah, that was uh, that was I believe my grade. Um, I'm sticking with that. I think it's a really really great draft class. They played the board nicely. Um, I know fans probably would have liked to see you know interior defensive line at some point or um you know another wide receiver but i i just think they they really went for value and, and got some really great value um you know especially uh day three they, they really got a lot of good guys yeah and i also i can't remember if it was i think it was a minus that i gave uh for them as well uh because i actually um uh, mark lawrence who does a uh, his annual 
uh, playbook guide that comes out every year. It's a handicapping guide, but it's excellent for the NFL and college football. You should definitely, if you're, if you're a gambler and you just like to get some really good information that you can use in a, a magazine form, uh, he does a great job. Uh, you can check that out over at playbooksports.com. Anyway, um, because our relationship, he asked me for grades. Uh, he was putting something together on his uh, on, on his magazine. And so um, I, I'm pretty sure, and I hadn't done grades at that point, um, but I went ahead and uh, pretty sure my grade, matter of fact, let me look at it right here. Yep, it's Kansas City A-. And a matter of fact, again, I had every team in the AFC West got at least an A-. minus. That's how strong I felt, I don't know about you, but I felt that every team in the AFC West did good during the draft. So, okay. Uh, a couple more things before I let you go. And okay. what do you think, are there any other players that you think that the Chiefs are going to add to the team uh, or could add to the team or position-wise? Like, Because uh, there are some players that are still available, of course, in free agency. Is there a position or a player that you could see the team maybe adding before the start of the season? You know, I mean, they have some cap space. They could, you know, maybe if they feel like they're weak or, or at a certain spot or they have an injury during training camp or something that kind of shakes things up, um, they, they could certainly go out and make a trade or, or find, you know, someone who's maybe a, a late cut, um, you know, veteran, something like that. But I, I think right now they're kind of comfortable just letting guys compete. Um, I, I'd be surprised if there were any, like, really, like, big ads um, I'm sure they'll have a couple like tryout guys uh, at, at you know their early early portion of like training camp or um, you know maybe one or two signings of someone who's kind of you know fallen to the wayside or um, you know something happens. Okay. Um, I, I think you know w- one more thing I'll, I'll I'll talk about before letting you go the punter battle that's something to keep an eye on with yes. uh, you know Tommy Townsend's no longer there so. You've got Punt God, Matt Matariza, and, and you've got Ryan uh, from, from BYU. And, um, you know, uh, Dave Tobe said it's a real close battle. And um, we'll, we'll see who, who comes out on top. I think, you know, it's going to come down to the little things. It's going to come down to holding and, you know, who Harrison Bucker likes in that role best. It's going to come down to, you know, can some of these guys run like a fake? You know, can they execute some of the fakes that they like? Because, Tommy's a guy who who threw four passes. He threw a pass, a fake pass in games every single year, basically. So, um, you know, they do like to run fakes with their punters. And, um, you know, Matt Arise is a guy I think he ran one or two in college for uh, San Diego State. I don't I don't know much uh, about uh, whether or not uh, Ryan did, but, um, you know, it, it could come down to something as – minuscule or, or minute or uh, uh, I guess we view it that way or I view it sure. that way, right? Um, it, it might not come down to the fact that Ariza can punt the ball out of the stadium. Uh, it, it might just come down to something simple like that. Well, I, as a Jet fan, I was, of course, the Jets were the first team to take a real serious look at him uh, while he was still like in limbo. And then um, they, were, he, they even looked at him and it was like, oh, are they going to add him to the team? And But they, they got this – and look, when you're a fan, you're like, come on, are they really sticking with the 35-year-old punter journeyman over this kid, giving him a chance with his talent? He could be a pro bowler for the next 15 years. Yeah. That's the kind of feeling that you have as a Jet fan, letting this guy walk out of the building. And then, of course, he signs with the Chiefs of all teams. You're thinking, oh, of course, well, the Super Bowl team gets uh, maybe, the most talented punter to come yeah. out in college. Here's the thing. Maybe they go with the, with the other kid, the BYU kid, and they let Matt walk, and they suddenly might. you have another chance at him. And well, yeah, you know, that 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 could be the case. I mean, they they um, you know, they, they might do that. But then, you know, another thing to consider too is that Matt was a place kicker, also. Um, yes. In uh in uh, college, so yep. you know that's another guy who can you know play the place kicker or, or kick off as well. So yeah. you know, um, ha- having the the ability to do different things, you know, that sometimes can come. Uh, and play a, a big role. So we'll, we'll see, you know, maybe yep. they want to keep him around for his ability to kick too. Who knows? 
Yeah, because uh, and by the way, uh, Ray Cow was uh, a little bit of a uh, write up in the draft guide, uh, four year starter, and uh, talked about uh, the fact that you know he does have a good power leg, um, but uh, the hang time that's the question is whether or not he's got the hang time that uh, teams or the Chiefs would be looking for. But uh, they say his placement and consistency are NFL ready. So should be a very interesting uh, competition to take a look at as well. Okay. Um, and then, so the college free agents they signed, um, again, Bailey and Steele, just because skill positions, you know that they've got stats and and the position is open. So I've got those guys. We talked about Driscoll McDowell on the offensive line, Rakow at punter. Uh, is there any other college free agents that you would say they you would you believe could could make this roster? Um, you know, a linebacker, a guy like Curtis Jacobs out of Penn State. I think he was uh, highly regarded. Someone that yeah. a lot of people thought would be drafted. There's a there's, um, a, there's a write up in the guide on him. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Baby in love at senior, the defensive tackle, I think is another guy to kind of watch. The Chiefs have a lot of veterans in the defensive line room, but they don't have a lot of young guys. I know they like Neil Farrell Jr. because they traded for him uh, last season, but he didn't get a lot of opportunities last season. So I wonder, you know, does he take a step up this next year? Is he someone? Um, I, obviously, Isaiah Bugs has some off field stuff going on right now. So I, I don't know if he's long for the roster, but. Um, you know, a guy like like Fabian Lovett, someone who could you know maybe surprise and uh, you know um, jump jump up in there, and you know maybe he's someone who is your uh, your your fifth or sixth uh, interior guy if you keep that many. Yeah, matter of fact, Lovett also uh, because he had a potential fifth round grade as a four year starter in college football, uh, transferred from Mississippi State to FSU. Uh, team captain, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got write-ups on Love It, and then Jacobs was a fourth round. Right. Uh, he, he's a little. He's a little older. Um, Love It. So I think that was one of the reasons that he kind of fell out of the draft. Okay. Because um, NFL teams tend to be a little bit ageist, <laughs> um, so oh, to speak. But, we understand that. Yes. Right. Um, so. Uh, but I think you know, there's there's obviously some talent there that they can yeah um, harness absolutely. Uh, the Chiefs uh, love uh, yeah. love having six, seven linebackers for whatever reason. I don't know that you necessarily need them, but, you know, uh, and they like their undrafted free agents. Jack Cochran, Cam Jones are, are guys that they've kind of slotted in, had on the roster, and, you know, they got three guys this year who, uh, you know, they're all athletic and talented in their own right, but I think Jacobs is probably the uh, eye-popping guy. Yeah, I mean, out of all the interviews I've done with the with, with the teams that I'm responsible for in the guide, uh, the Chiefs have j just as much, if not more, players that were signed in free agency after the draft that had draftable grades than just about any team. That again, I haven't gone through 32, <laughs> but just my teams, and that's interesting considering this is the Super Bowl team, right. back to back Super Bowl it, team that it, you would it, think. I mean, it's nice because they they have that you know that Super Bowl that they can you know here here's our four um, Super Bowl trophies that they can show these guys when they bring them yeah. in for pre draft visits or whatever. Or even you know, I'm sure there's someone if they're on a, a Zoom call or whatnot, they'll take the laptop down to the Hall of Honor and show them. But um, you know, they they have that to hang their hat on. But this year, one thing they had that they haven't had um, recently um, during priority free agency is money. Um, they had a lot more uh, cap space and a lot more money they could kind of throw around. Um, so I think they were able to really, you know, um, be like, hey, you know, we, we want you to come here. You know, sure. other teams want you, but we want you more and we're going to prove it with our with our checkbooks. So hey. I, I think that that was uh, that played a part this year for sure. And maybe it makes sense, too, because when you're a Super Bowl team, everybody wants your players and you lose guys. And when you lose guys, there are spots open at the end of those uh, depth charts. And then this is where you replenish them. And that's what we, le we let off the show talking about. Uh, that's what you have to do uh, to uh, keep putting out uh, teams that are competing for Super Bowl championships. Before I let you leave, the last thing is the schedule. So, um what did you think? What was the fans' reaction to to the schedule for uh, getting the Ravens kick things off 
uh, on uh, week one at home. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you saw last year the kind of, you know, up-and-coming team was the one who he got in week one. I think I think they're happy and okay with this being their, their team. I think they're a little bit more familiar with the Ravens than they were with the Lions. I think they're, in general, just more familiar with the AFC. And I think, you know, if, if you start off hot, um, you could wrap up this, you could wrap up the number one seed pretty early, <laughs> right? Um, and, and I think that's got to be what they're they're thinking, you know, <laughs> knocking off some of this top AFC competition early, um, you know, really before they get rolling, right? Because uh, you know, er, early in the season, you know, teams have some some hiccups and what have you. Um, so if they can get off to a hot start, if they're looking at a you know four one or a 5-0 heading into week six, they're going to be thrilled because they have a tough late late schedule. Ooh, I got someone out front. <laughs> you need to get that? I don't. I don't okay. think so. So, um, yeah, just quickly going over this. See, this is the reason why I, I, I think schedules going too deep into this just is a waste of time. Because if you look here, you got Atlanta, the Chargers, and the Saints back-to-back -back before the bye. Now, on one hand, maybe those are teams that uh, – sort of like last year, they were all uh, just uh, non-playoff teams and you know, maybe they're around 500, maybe they're not. Or maybe all three teams are playoff teams this year. You don't know. So that's why it's just an unknown. It, you could just immediately look at this and go, wow, that's a pretty good run. That should be three, definitely three wins in a row right there after a really tough start, as long as, of course, Joe Burrows is healthy. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the way that you can look at it. But it's just crazy to kind of think ahead uh, of, of what, what's going to happen. And especially with all the injuries that happened in the AFC, a quarterback, uh, you just, nobody predicted that and you can never predict that uh, from year to year. But the key, well, I, think, I think the crazy thing, I think it's from like week eight onward. I, I want to say it's week eight onward. I think they play every single game in an outdoor stadium, you know, in like cold weather temperatures. Um, I, it's week nine on, I believe. No, it's week eight on. Yeah, because uh, week, week nine is an arrowhead. So week um, 10, you got Denver, Buffalo, well, Carolina, and then you got uh, – you're talking about cold temperature games? Yeah. Okay. Look at that, Pittsburgh. That's the second to last game of the season. And Denver, the yeah. last game. And that team and that stadium has actually been uh, a tough venue Yeah, uh, for they're, they're, Kansas City recently. We, I think – yeah. Everyone assumes that like week fifth or week uh, seventh. You still there, Charles? Charles is his his Wi-Fi is just barely hanging on. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. <laughs> we're back. What are we saying, uh, Charles? I, we're, we got three games in eleven days, ten days. Three games, okay. eleven yes. days, ten days. I think um, so five teams or six teams in the NFL have are going through that this year. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, when is and it's, that? A tough, it's a tough slate starting week 15. Okay, so, so you got, Cle you've got Cleveland uh, on that Sunday. Okay. Um, and, and then you've got, uh, Houston on the Saturday and then you play the, um, Wednesday game against the Steelers. Or Christmas <laughs> Wednesday day. game. Yeah. Oh, Christmas. Wednesday. Okay. Yep. Wow. So, and, and yeah, that's just, a, it's a tough stretch. I mean, obviously, you know, Houston uh, and Cleveland, those are two really good AFC teams. Steelers yep. are expected, you know, they always play, play well. Oh, yeah. uh, and, you know, the Chiefs don't typically play great. I mean, the Patrick Mahomes era has been different, but they don't typically play great at Pittsburgh, just historically. They haven't. And, you know, they're getting them on Christmas Day in, you know, week 17. Could be a could be a wintry game. You never know. Yeah. And it could be a huge game, you would think, for Pittsburgh because that division is just going to be so entertaining Brilliant. to watch. And really, the AFC West, I think, could be that way as well. Yeah. Um, you, you have the Raiders looking like they're going – they have the potential if the quarterback comes through. And uh, you know the Chargers are just going to be better. That's just yes. – I mean, I, I've always been of the opinion that, you know, coaching is the biggest thing in the NFL and, you know, immediately uh, coaching upgrade with, with Harbaugh there. Yep. Uh, so the divisions, who they who are the two divisions they have this year? Um, I want to say, what is it, AFC um, North and uh, the 
Yeah. NFC South. NFC South. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And how many prime timers? I see the Bucks here on Monday night. I want to say it's like five true primetime games, and then they have the two, um, the Christmas Day and the, the Friday. Black Friday game. Yeah. Okay, you got the Friday Raider game there, and you got the Brown game uh, is on a Sunday, but uh, Saturday, Houston, and then Wednesday, Pittsburgh. Yeah, so, yeah, and then there's that San Francisco game. There's that rematch with San Francisco right after the bye. So right. uh, that's, of course, going to be entertaining. Um, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on San Francisco. Mark my words. This is something, uh, speaking of Mark Lawrence, Mark is going to do, he's, he's, again, he's a legendary handicapper. We do games. Uh, we do uh, previews uh, each week. We'll continue to do that on the R Lads channel this year. And one of the things that we will talk about, because we talk about it every year when we're making our predictions, is every team that is coming off a loss in the Super Bowl, for the most part, has – an issue the next year somehow, whether it's a hangover. Uh, I mean, t- only t- the only teams that usually survive that are teams were just, you know, they're just elite, like Tom Brady elite or, um, you know, Patrick Holmes say elite, that kind of thing. Um, sorry, but San Francisco is just not that. Uh, they're very good, but they're not elite. They're not that. They don't fit that category. Just look at Philadelphia last year. If there was another two weeks of the season, they probably don't even make the playoffs. That's how they were just about to fall apart. So every Super Bowl champion loser uh, has issues. And so uh, keep an eye on that with San Francisco. Not that Chiefs fans care. But just, I, I think know, the, the biggest that. I think the biggest thing for the Eagles last year was the fact that, that they lost their coordinators, right? Absolutely. That was, that, yes. that was a tough change to go through. Yep. I, I don't know that there was that much turnover. Uh, in San no. Francisco on their coaching staff, so I, I oh, no, think they no. they won't defense. Have that. That's it, coordinator. That's all. Yeah. So, so I think you know, obviously there will be some, you know, a bit of a learning curve there and whatnot with the new DC and some new personnel. But I, I think you know, um, so long as, as Shanahan's there, they'll still be uh, competitive. Yeah, it's just a matter of uh, I guess normally it's one of those things where something comes up, you know, whether it's. Uh, you know, uh, injuries or, uh, just bad luck, uh, whatever, but, uh, it's hard to lose the Super Bowl one year and come back and then get back or even improve upon that. It's not, that, again, it's not that it, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it's just, it's hard. To do. It, it's, it's hard to, to buck history in the NFL. I mean, the chiefs are, are going for it with the, That's uh, it. the three peat attempt this year. So, uh, we'll see if they can, if they can become the ones. Yeah. I mean, the Bengals, you know, Joe Burrow, they, they did it. Uh, but again, that's, I think Joe Burrow is, I think he's elite. And uh, sorry, Brock Purdy's not elite. Uh, I think we <laughs> saw that at Super Bowl Sunday. That's the difference. Uh, Chiefs had Mahomes and San Francisco had Purdy. And uh, I think that's what it all came down to. So um, anyway, that's going to wrap it up. Charles, I appreciate it as uh, always. Uh and uh, even though our old, always uh, will look a lot more like a real always in a few years, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate it uh, definitely uh, for the, the the few times that you've been on so far. And I'm sure we're going to make it many more and we'll be back in the training camp preseason kind of window to talk more about the team. Uh, we'll have a much better grasp on what's going on, but appreciate uh, all the information. I'm sure Tucker, uh, our draft guru, excuse me, our, our depth chart guru, is going to go ahead and make those changes immediately that you recommended. <laughs> so uh, that's another thing we appreciate. And uh, again, check out the draft review guide. This is last year's, but the 2024 version will be out in a few weeks. Uh, I've got a week to, to finish my uh, reports and then uh, you can get those uh, either in PDF or hard copy, hard copy form. So check that out at rlads.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you're a Chief fan, this way you'll be alerted for when we do this again. So, Charles, uh, appreciate it. Uh, you're going to be on uh, – what's your next, like, uh, appearance somewhere? Or what's uh, – you got a content coming out uh, sometime soon? What, what's next? Well, whatever I have planned, you can always just uh, follow me on on X, formerly Twitter, at GoldMCTNFL. It, it'll all be there, whatever it is, whether it's a podcast, a written article, uh, you know, um, it, who knows? Who knows what I'm up to? Maybe, That's I'll a good start, yeah. maybe I'll start in a commercial with Travis Kelsey. You never know. Never know. Never okay. Know. Well, that's, <laughs> that's another story. And by the way, we didn't even t- – we not that we're going to, but and we didn't even talk about 
the Harrison Butker story. How about that? Well, well, we went hey, through a video. We, we, we and... did talk about the fact that he might lo lose his kickoff job for, because, of the <laughs> yeah. new, because of the new kick return rules. But, yeah. You know. Um, and, 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 and that's because we all know he's not going anywhere. Yeah. That's no, why. Not, it's just not. a silly <laughs> conversation to have. Yeah. So, all right, Charles, great job. Thank you. And we'll talk to you again, hopefully, in a couple of months. Can't wait. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, Greg. You got it.